I'm going to share just a, a brief introduction about our very impressive speaker for this afternoon. I'm really delighted to be having the opportunity to hear from her. The Honourable Michelle Rempel is the Member of Parliament for Calgary Centre North and the Minister of State for Western Economic Diversification. She was elected to the House of Commons on May 2nd, 2011. On July 15, 2013, she was appointed to the 28th Ministry of Canada as the Minister of State for Western Economic Diversification. Previously, Michelle was appointed Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of the Environment on May 25, 2011. Minister Rempel is the youngest female appointed to Cabinet in Canadian history. In November of 2012, Maclean's Magazine named Michelle as their Parliamentarian of the Year, rising star calling her one of the government's most impressive performers. Prior to her election, Michelle was the director of the University of Calgary's Institutional Programs Division and built a strong reputation for successfully promoting innovative academic and business research partnerships. Michelle also worked in the Technology Commercialization Division of the University of Manitoba, where she assisted in administering commercialization strategies for a portfolio of over 200 emerging technologies. She also worked as a managerial consultant in Calgary, applying her knowledge of intellectual property management within a professional service framework in the areas of strategic planning, project management, process re-engineering, and marketing where she gained insight in the health and educational sectors. She holds a degree in economics. In 2010, Michelle was named one of Canada's top 100 most powerful women by the Women's Executive Network for her senior level work in directing a large team of professionals in the field of research and development administration. She is currently co-chair of the Conservative Party's National Policy Committee, previously co-chaired Alberta's CPC President's Council, and prior to that was co-chair of Alberta Congress, the Conservative Party's Policy Forum for Alberta CPC members. She has also been a very committed volunteer in Calgary. She has planned events, raised tens of thousands of dollars, and acted as a volunteer leader for numerous local not-for-profit organizations, including the Children's Wish Foundation and the Northern Hills Community Association. And I can't believe that she's not 90 years old with all that she's <laughs> packed into her life. Please welcome Michelle Rempel. so good to be home. Um, I just came back from Ottawa and um, it's, it's always a pleasure, you know, um, Mrs. Harper, I was at an event with her last night and she talks about, you know, there's this point, cause it's a long flight and you do it twice a week where you kind of get over the Saskatchewan border and the plane starts landing and it's just like, <sighs> so thank you so much for welcoming me home. Um, a few uh, notes of acknowledgement before I get started. Um, my, I have a few colleagues here that I'd like to uh, personally acknowledge that are good friends of mine. So, uh, Councillor Joe Maglioka from Ward 2, who is at the back there. <laughs> Councillor Sean Chu from Ward 4. And, of course, the wonderful Head of Foresight, MLA for Calgary Fish Creek. Oh, look at that. All three levels of government, I know. And if I've missed anyone, my apologies. But uh, it's wonderful to see you guys here today. Um, but the big kudos needs to go to the IDI, to Malik and his whole team. I first um, encountered IDI, I guess, about a year and a half ago, right, Malik, when you guys opened up the Calgary chapter. And ever since then, I've just been so blown away by the warmth and inclusivity and the true spirit uh, that this group, group promotes. So, you know, oftentimes we talk about one of the the best things that Canada has to offer in terms of uh, its standing internationally is it's our commitment to a pluralistic society and to understanding and tolerance. And, you know, I just love the work that the IDI does. So thank you for having me and a big round of applause for Malik. And the group. So, um, 
you know, I was I was asked to speak today on a topic that's near and dear to my heart, which is you know women in professional careers, and you know the, the title that's on the screen is challenges. But I think I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the fact that we live in a country where there's actually a lot of opportunity for women. Um, that's first and foremost. I, I remember when I first took my seat in the House of Commons, it was it was this moment where you know you real I it was this. I can't describe it. It's something I'll always hold uh, very close to my heart where you know you have this moment where you realize that a lot of people that you represent now have put their trust in you. Uh, but moreover, the fact that I was a very young woman um, sitting in a you know democratic forum where I can speak for policy and and the issues that the people that I represent care about uh, in in a free country where I can say whatever I want and not be persecuted for it. And, and, and my engagement in the political process is not only tolerated but encouraged. That's something that's very rare. Uh, it's something that's unique. And it's not just unique to our political system, but it's also unique to business. You know, I, I do believe that we have a system in which there is the, the foundation for equality of opportunity. Do we have work to do to increase women engagement in all uh, different aspects of civil society? Yes. Do we have... Um, to identify some of the barriers that create those challenges and overcome them. Yes, absolutely. But the bottom line is, is as we talk about International Women's Day, as Canadians, we are truly blessed. We are so blessed to live in this country, and I really think that that is, uh, you know, the place that we need to start from, is an appreciation of what it means to be Canadian and to be a woman living in Canada. I think once we sort of have that in our heart, then we can start saying, what do we do with that? You know, uh, I, I have to. I have to tell. I have to bring up the WestJet pilot. Um, no, I. For, for those of you who didn't see this, um, it, it came out. I guess about two days ago. Uh, There's a female pilot who was flying WestJet pilot uh, flight, and somebody who was in the cabin, one of the passengers, took it upon himself to write a note, which basically read, "I really wish WestJet had told me there was a lady pilot flying. Your 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 place is in the home." Why aren't you with your children? You know, I can't, I can't believe that you're doing this. If I had known, I wouldn't have flown WestJet. Uh, you know, I think one of the, the beautiful things about Canada is that no matter what a woman chooses to do in this country, it's the equality of that choice is that what we should focus on. So, you know, whether a woman chooses to be a pilot and be in the sky, or chooses to stay at home with her children, or chooses to do both, those are all equally valid, and those are all choices that we should equally celebrate. And I think that's the place that we need to start from. I, you know, and I, and I do want to talk today a significant amount of time about some of the barriers that women face. And I want to share some of my personal experiences. And Malik, I've got my watch, don't worry. <laughs> I'm going to do it out of time. Um, it, it's that, I think it's that fundamental belief that all of our choices are, are equally valid that we have to start evaluating some of the barriers from. Um, you know, I, I remember, um, I, I don't have a family, so I've, I've made a choice. I've, the, the hours I work, you know, the, the amount of time that I spend in the air, I know it's very, it would be very difficult for me to have a family, and that's a choice that I've consciously made. And now I'm getting to the age where I'm kind of going, <laughs> you know, is this a choice that I'm comfortable with? But it's, it's, it's I think that there, we also have to acknowledge that it's okay to not have everything, to, to if you make a choice to pursue something, oftentimes as women, it's like, okay, well, you have to have five children, all of them in four different sports and six different teams and driving all over the place. And, and also you have to be CEO plus scrapbooking extraordinaire plus plus. And I, I just think that there's this, you know, there's this woman that just doesn't exist. And the, the area that we do exist in is somewhere in here. And I think, you know, on, on the theme of International Women's Day in terms of challenges, we really have to look to each other and, ex and support each other's choices and not be judgmental of them. You know, the, 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 what I always say to my staff, and I have a lot of, I have, you know, about equal half and half, but the women in my team, you know, I say, if you choose to stay late and work and get a project through, I value that choice as much as I value the person who has gone home to get her children. 
or if somebody's gotten a nanny to go pick them up. You know, it's, it's just acknowledging that, you know, there isn't a level of perfection, that that's a myth. And what's more important, and what's more important for us to look in terms of overcoming challenges is really understanding what we want to do with our life. I think, you know, when I, when I, oftentimes women work hard, but they don't work smart. And it's incumbent upon us to really have a vision for what you want to accomplish or what your organization wants to accomplish, what your department wants to accomplish, and just hold that firm in your heart and put your, put your work behind that. Being able to articulate where you're going, what your vision, what your dream is, how you're impacting your community and, and the ways around it and people around you, that's something that will draw others to you and will help you succeed in your career. Um, and, and, and oftentimes this frightens somebody. A, a woman with a vision is sometimes a very scary thing. Um, and uh, you know, I have this book in my, in my office in Ottawa, it's, and I get comments on it whenever I have people come through, they kind of see it, and it's called Nice Girls Don't Get the Corner Office. And I know that sounds very aggressive, but you know, what does a nice girl mean? I, oftentimes I think that when um, we are assertive and make tough decisions, that that's you know, and I've had to overcome this, that, you know, when you make a stand or you make a choice or you do something, not everybody is going to like you. And sometimes we aim to please before we aim to succeed. And those two things sometimes are mutually exclusive because if you don't stand for something, you stand for nothing. And uh, I, I was on the, just thinking about this whole theme, I was on the plane the other night and the... I don't know if any of you guys watched the Steve Jobs movie. Ashton Kutcher was terrible in it. Terrible. But there was one line, uh, so Steve Jobs, of course, was the head of Apple, and uh, he had a lot of challenges in his career. But midway through the film, they were sort of depicting some of the challenges that with Apple was having, and he was trying to get this product through. And one of his long-term staff came in and said, you're, basically, you're not being nice to people. And he said, well, my, my job isn't to be nice to people, it's to make them better. And sometimes I think we have to keep that in mind too, is that if you are seeking a leadership role in your life, and leadership doesn't mean you know, necessarily a CEO position, it means you are in control of something, you are pushing a vision forward, you are leading an initiative, that you do have to make those tough choices. That said, I also think that sometimes we don't realize that we have to, uh, you can respect someone without liking them, and that you can have differences in opinion and still work to um, achieve an outcome. So all of these sorts of values, I think, are something that we really need to consider in terms of challenges for women in the, in the corporate workplace. It's overcoming things that we've been socialized to believe uh, that we have to, have to do or, or how to behave, and, and then overcoming those in order to, um, to achieve our vision. So step one, of course, is having a vision. Step two is knowing that you don't have to be nice in terms of how we would uh, be socialized to define that. Um, and then step three is knowing what the landscape is around you. Oftentimes, I don't know, many of you who have worked in a department or whatnot, I find, you know, you, you get stuck at your desk and you start, you know, I've got to grind this report out, I've got to, you know, get this project done, whatnot. Oftentimes as women, because we value time above else, all else, I value time, I value time with my friends, my family, I want to get that in, I want to maximize the use of my time, we start getting this tunnel vision wherein we actually need to understand what the landscape and the context is around us in order to make good decisions. So if, if, you, if you ever find yourself in that situation and you look around, don't ever think that standing by the water cooler for 10 minutes to understand what's going on in the accounting department or you know, in the shop next door is a bad thing. In fact, that's often crucial to your career because the understanding of a broader landscape helps you make better decisions. As a policymaker, if I shut my eyes off to or my ears off to other points of view, I'm not doing my job. Now, I might not always agree with somebody's point of view, but it is my job to listen and synthesize that information um, and, and challenge people's positions as well. So never, you know, never remove yourself from taking the operable in your organization, um, other points of view, because at the end of the day, that information is power and it's leverage in terms of promoting 
your viewpoint of the food chain, across the food chain, whatever. Um, so I, I strongly encourage you to do that. Make sure that you network and think about networking from the perspective of information gathering. Um, you know, something I wanted to impart today uh, in terms of a, per a personal experience is always make allies in unexpected places. We like to fight. I know a lot of us are feisty creatures and, uh, you know, it's, it's very easy, uh, especially, especially in politics, especially in politics. Yeah, I'm not listening to you. You know, uh, you've just completely eviscerated me in the media or, you know, this group is completely against what I stand for or it's, it's very easy to put these on. And at the end of the day, it's actually a very small community in this country and I've learned that as I've traveled more and certainly become more active in the city. Um, at the end of the day, you never know when you're going to need someone's point of view or their help or what constituency they represent. And so I all, you should always be seeking to make allies in unexpected places. Again, if there's one value that I would tell you to take away from today is respect people. You don't have to like someone, you don't have to go for a beer with them, you don't have to take them for dinner, but you should always seek to build consensus when possible. Um, my, my personal experience is, um, uh, you know, I, I have a you know I have a party I'm affiliated with and, and a government's position that I make policy within that context. Um, when I was appointed to a parliamentary secretary for the Minister of the Environment, one of my jobs was to take questions in the House of Commons from my opposition critic, who is uh, Megan Leslie. She's the NDP opposition critic for the environment. She just killed me when I started. She was so good and. Um, <laughs> Oh, you know, I spent the summer sort of looking through QP clips because I was like, okay, I can't let her do this time again. <laughs> but um, I also thought, you know, we worked together on committee. I thought, okay, well, we're going to spend at least two years together in committee, parliamentary committee, looking at legislation, looking at studies. So, you know, we have one of two choices. We can either sit there and do this for two years or we can do something that resembles work. So I ended up phoning her up and I just said, look, I don't know if this is going to work or not, but would you like to go out for a beer? And let's just talk. And she's probably one of the people I'm closest to in Ottawa. Do we completely disagree on politics? Yes. <laughs> the things that we just, you know, we're not. But we also understand where we can work to consensus on certain issues. And I've actually been um, really impressed by the, some of the work that we've been able to get done uh, behind the scenes that is not reported in the media like the fact that we've we had three unanimous uh, Parliamentary reports that came out of the Environment Committee like that like unheard of right uh, we passed a we passed a national park uh, We we created a national park we created uh, we, we were successful in asks for budgets and you know, that's, if, if, if I hadn't made that, if I hadn't, and she, to her credit as well, if we hadn't made that conscious choice to seek out an ally in an unexpected place, I'm not sure any of that would have happened. Uh, so I just encourage you to, to think about that one person who drives you insane in your life mm -hmm. and, you know, ask yourself if you have to fight with them all the time or if there are ways that you can overcome that and especially if they're women because women need to support each other. Uh, oftentimes I think that, you know, there's a sort of crabs in the bucket mentality where one starts cuddling up the side and you have to pull the other one down to be successful. I'd like to see it as a rising tide floats all boats. And, uh, you know, I just encourage you to think about that as, um, as, as you look forward because we should be looking to, to prone each other. Now, I've painted a very rosy colored picture, uh, but at sometimes there, there, are, there are people who will seek to sabotage you. And, you know, shout out to our arms, armed forces here and, you know, for protecting our country. Sometimes you have to protect yourself as well. And there are people who you can't, who are an obstacle to something that's very important or are or, or seeking to harm you professionally, your credibility or your reputation. And you do have to deal with that. And going back to my first point about being nice, protecting yourself, your reputation, your vision, uh, and seeking to, to move beyond that is not a bad thing. And being assertive in who you are and being assertive in pushing back um, against someone is, is something that you have to do as a leader. And I, sometimes I find too that I had this situation with my sister a couple of weeks ago where she's had this person in her department that's just been 
very antagonistic to her. And for six months, I've listened to her sort of go to me and say, oh, you know, I, I just, I want to go to war. I want to die, blah, blah, blah. And, and I said, you know, finally, two weeks ago, I said, Sherry, well, why don't you don't? Why don't you just do something about it? Like, instead of talking about it, you've got the leverage, you know the context, you know you're in the right, you've got a team behind you, deal with it. And I find often sometimes, and I know myself, it's taken me a while to get to this point, we sit on something and stew. And, uh, you know, the Katy Perry song, you're going to hear me roar. Well, just roar. Like, don't, you're going to hear me. I hate that song. I hate it. I hate listening to it because it's like, my voice is going to come out. And it's like, just do something about it. The greatest <laughs> leaders are those who recognize the landscape and then do it. And oftentimes, as women, we don't. We like to stoop. We like to sit on something. We like to gossip each other to death. You know, um, where, and I, I just, that's a sign of maturity, and that's a sign of, of women leadership. And you know, I always, um, I always like to say too, if you are going to go to war, make sure that you will win. You should not go to war <laughs> unless you will win. So um, it, it's not necessarily, a, it's not necessarily a bad thing to have to do that at some point in your life. So a few fallacies um, in terms of women in, in the corporate workplace uh, that I think that we subscribe to that aren't true. Um, that we should always under-promise and over-deliver. No over-promise and over-deliver. The truth is that sometimes, uh, you know, we're socialized that, you know, the, the bottom line is, is that you do have to work harder than your male counterparts sometimes. And to the guys in the room, sorry, speaking to the ladies a little bit, but just know that when you're doing something, do it with excellence and don't be afraid to kind of exceed expectations or put something out there that's a little bit more that stretches your comfort zone. Um, the, the concept, I love this. Everybody is expendable. Everybody's expendable. No. The only expendable people are those that don't have leverage and haven't positioned themselves to succeed. Um, I, I, I firmly believe that. If you understand the context, that's why I wanted to talk about networking. If you've got a strong team around you, uh, you should always be in a position to add value to your corporation and to further that vision that we talked about at the front end of this. You know, question, question the motives of the people around you. When you know where you're going and when you know that vision that you have for your life or your organization or whatnot, if, make sure that when, as you succeed in leadership, you will have people who come to you. Always ask why. And, you know, and that will help you do two things. Number one, build a team of people around you who support you and what you want to do and care about you and share your vision. But it will also save your time. Um, and it will also help you avoid war. So you know, be very careful in who you trust and, and also you know, make sure that um, you're surrounding yourself with people that do share that vision uh, that you want to accomplish. Um, I guess, I guess what I'll do is, is just say, I, I do want to talk about sexism. I wasn't, you know, I, 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 I'm a believer in merit and that Canada is a meritocracy. You know, I, I, my story, you know, thank you for the kind introduction, but I did spend a lot of time working on my career, a lot of time. Um, to win a Conservative Party nomination in Calgary is a difficult thing at the best of times. Um, especially for the, for, for the federal party. When, I, when Minister Prentice resigned, um, there was about 18 people that sought the nomination. And I had spent six years uh, going to every single community association, uh, political event, hockey team, fundraiser, everything as possible so that I had a team uh, that was ready if, because I knew I wanted to run when the opportunity arose. But I also spent time, you know, learning the system, learning how to do this campaigning, all of these sorts of things. So, you know, it was very shocking that when I won the nomination, it was, it was, it was a personal blow to me. I, I had to learn how to deal with this. I was all excited because I, I was actually acclaimed in my nomination. I, no one decided to run against me at the end of the day because we just, we sold, we sold thousands of memberships. We just worked so hard and I was like, yeah killing it, awesome. And then it was, the guys around were like, probably just handed it to your spot. Kid you not. To this day, I, and, and, and I know that, so, so, so for that reason, I believe in merit. I believe in you know, being promoted on your work. But on the other hand, on the side of that, there are still barriers that we face at the top level of leadership in this country. 
the fact that um, you know you heard some of my professional background, um, I, I end up in the House of Commons. Uh, the way that people are sit, sat, seated is it's sort of se seniority. There's five rows, so when you hear somebody being a backbencher, that means that they sit on the top row. They don't have a government position. They've just been recently elected. I sit on the second row because I've been appointed to cabinet and. When the Prime Minister stands up in the House of Commons, I end up being in his shot. I, people see me. So if you watch the evening news and you see a clip of the Prime Minister on question period, there I am. The number one comment I've had in my office, and Joe will see, say this in the last year, is how can you, why are you a blonde bookend behind Stephen Harper? You're, you're just a blonde. You're just there to, you know, and it's, you know, the, my pushback was, well, what color should my hair be? You know, like, <laughs> Brunette, blue, and or 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 where should I sit as a young woman who's accomplished this? Like, should I not be in cabinet? And I I think that as as women, when when those sorts of things happen, uh, we have to. It's not partisan. It's not. Um, it's not you know hardcore feminism. It's standing up for what's right. And we should never be evaluated on the basis of our appearance, our gender, our demographics, or, you know, where we come from. We should, be, we should be evaluated on our competency, our policy stance, our performance, our character, uh, our comments, and our actions. And at some point in your life, you've either had this happen to you or will have, have it happen to you. And you might brush it off. It's being in a meeting with your guy friends and having them introduce you know, being introduced as, hey, you know, she's like the hot chick in our office, ha, 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 you know, or, you know, being assumed that you, um, you know, you do something that you don't, or being judged for um, the fact that you decided not to wear a suit to work, but a really cute dress. Those sorts of things are what we need to push back on, no matter where it comes from. And I'm, I'm very firm in this. Um, and I'll, you know, especially with social media right now, social media provides a platform uh, to attack women from an anonymous source. I get it every day. If you go through Twitter right now and search my name, there, I guarantee you, there's someone who's been like, "Oh, you're blonde and you're blah, 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 and terrible woman and stupid." Like, and it's just, you know, and it's there. So I've learned to sort of block it out. But I think that we need to start calling it. Um, and what's more frightening is that these platforms sometimes even escalate and there's threats of violence. So I guess it's, um, it's something that is incumbent upon all of us as women in terms of barriers is to make sure that we're calling, supporting each other. Even if you don't agree with someone's philosophy or where they are in life, we need to stand together for what's right. And that's a Canadian value, is equality and opportunity. So I guess what I'll leave you with is this. Uh, you know, we live in a country that has full of opportunities. Uh, it, it, where we do have the opportunity for equality. There are issues, you know, pay equity, uh, availability of, of, of jobs in certain areas, women's participation in politics, uh, how we balance family life and, uh, and work. All of those sorts of things are issues that we need to address sexism in this country. But that said, the opportunity exists in this country that you can do anything. Uh, you know, I stand here before you being elected uh, to federal government at 31 years old from a middle class family. Um, that's, that's the level of opportunity that's available in this country. You, know, you look at our entrepreneurial stats, we have so many successful women entrepreneurs in this country. Um, the opportunity is there and now we need to stand together in solidarity and make sure that we're respecting our colleagues' choices, we're respecting women's choices, and we're working to overcome some of these challenges so that when people around the world think about the issue of where do women do best, they think about our country, and that's certainly my vision. Happy International Women's Day.